Coming up next on Futures in Biotech, we head over to MIT to speak with Dr. Anne Grabiel. She explains how she uses optogenetics to study learning and cognition. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by CashFly at CashFly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, Episode 80, Light Up the Brain. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there going to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would be equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapist? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that will end up rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so oh, this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier. Today's guest was elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the USA in 1988, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1991, Institute of Medicine in 1994, elected fellow in the American Academy of Neurology in 97, and in 2002 received the Killian Award, the highest honor given to an MIT professor. Also in 2002, she won the National Medal of Science, America's highest science award. Her work has uncovered many facets of the human mind, including how the forebrain is controlled in motor activity, procedural learning, and cognition. These discoveries have also aided research, researchers on working on Parkinson's and Huntington's, as well as many addictive disorders. Importantly, how we make and break habits. Our guest is a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. Welcome to the show. Thanks ever so much. Um, one of the things I did, knowing that this would be a big brain show, um, I inv <laughs> invited a co-host, and uh, our co-host is Dr. Dave Broadbeck. He's Associate Professor and Chair, Department of Psychology at Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie, on, uh, Sault Ste. Marie Ontario. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Dave. Really appreciate so, you coming on to help me out here. It's always a pleasure to be on the show, Mark, and uh, you make me, you, you build me up more than I'm worth, but I appreciate it. <laughs> well, um, hey, Dave. you know, we... Hey. We've done a, a few brain shows, and I'm, I was really glad you were there. Um, and, and if people want to, they can go back and listen to um, Dr. Milner's uh, interview. Uh, the interview with Dr. Milner, she was fantastic. Um, uh, Terry Sanowski, you know, those were some really great. Um, that was fun. Um, interviews and and really breaking into the the, uh, the inner workings of the human mind, and Eric Kendall as well. But let me ask uh, Dr. Grabiel, um, do, do you believe that the brain is the most complex machine in the universe? Oh, universe is a big word. <laughs> <laughs> universe. But, no, in our and little it, knowledge okay, well then, look, sphere, it's, it's pretty complicated. But of course, you know, biology is complicated. It's all complicated, right? But biology is all about, um, it's all about control levels, about one level after another of control mechanisms turning on and off stuff and the brain that's the essence of the brain that's we have so many little controllers operating on what we do and how we perceive and think how we feel so is is that how you decided to work on the human brain that you could actually wrap your uh you know your hands around the the sort of in a reductionist approach? So look, um... Oh, we froze? No, we didn't. Uh, we're fine. Um, 
meet. I, I, I mean, I find that the brain and have for many years just completely fascinating that this very small organ could let us talk the way we're doing now or think, have emotion, think about the future, plan, ruminate on the past sometimes. And it, but it's all part of of this nature that we have, we know about on Earth. So it, it, somehow physics and chemistry and biology got themselves together and and uh, worked this out in biological tissue. It's, it's an absolutely amazing thing. And it, it is amazing that when a tree is little, it's a little seed and eventually one day it's this huge, wonderful being of its own. But our brain, Let's us do things that that are uh, that are unique, that are new, that have never been done before, and so it's a, it's kind of like a huge, huge mystery, and that sort of thing appeals to those of us who are in neuroscience. It's it's a it's an amazing field. It's just exploding, and I think realistically, almost realistically, we can hope to help people by what we're learning, and so I I care a whole lot about that. I mean, this reminds me of <clears throat> what, uh, I mean, at, at the end of uh, uh, Origin of Species, uh, the last page, actually, Darwin says there is grandeur in this view of life. And whenever I uh, think about that, actually, I, I, I just got a little, almost got a tear in my eye, and that may sound cheesy. Uh, but I always feel that way, that exactly what you're describing, the idea that there's so much going on up there, and the amount, the things that we're doing right now, and using this equipment that people invented and the idea that most of it is stuff that we aren't even aware is going on. Uh, right. So little of it is accessible. It's com almost completely inaccessible to consciousness, if you want to use that word. I asked a class yesterday, how do you turn a bicycle? And they said, you turn it, uh, if you want to make a right turn, you turn the handlebars right. And actually, that's, <laughs> not, what people, that's not what people do. They turn right. a little bit to the left and turn right, right? And that... Yeah. But, but they don't know that because if you just turn the handlebars to the right, you actually fall over. Um, and there's so much learning and cognition that is completely implicit. And that, uh, to me, is, is, is what makes things like psychology and cognitive neuroscience just, for lack of a better, well, use the word appropriately, awesome. It really is awesome. Like there is awe in it. Well, I, th I think it's wonderful that someone has a nerve to say it's awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. And... So what's caught me and actually caught, I think, people in the lab is, is just what you're talking about, that so much of brain work is not available to us to, to, to even sense or perceive or know about. And, you know, we, you know, we study habit a lot. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how much... During the day, we do stuff that we, we do almost automatically. And so we've kind of just, we're just kind of knocking on the edge of the door, thinking about things that are conscious aspects of brain activity and things that aren't, and what makes the shift from something that's goal-directed and you know, we know what we're doing, you know, we're studying, 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 so one day we can grow up and be a doctor or something like that, or we're walking, walking, walking to get that ice cream cone. But mm. but most of it is is not, is beyond being a parent, and we learn almost all of this. Yeah. So the brain is a huge learning capacity, just vast learning capacity, and that's what we're interested in studying. And the amazing part, I suppose, is that it starts from a single cell. And those billions of cells interconnect in a, an incredible network capable of learning uh, and developed through time, through age, into the, into the, to the perfect uh, learning machine. One of the things that uh, attracted me to your work and uh, prompted me to invite you to be on the show was that you, you take a, a truly comprehensive look at the human brain in, you know, using molecular biology techniques, uh, uh, electrophysiology uh, combined with imaging, and then... Uh, you know, organismal level behavior patterns and learning. Um, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what your focus is on. So it, it, would it be fair to say that your lab focuses on one um, major structure and its inner workings and then use multiple techniques to approach it? Or do you 
you use multiple techniques to study, you know, the entire uh, process. The, well, the entire brain, I, I suppose. It's kind of a journalistic <laughs> question, but which way, which way do you, how do you see your work? How do you organize your work? Maybe we can break it down and then start going over some of the, uh, the, the fun aspects. So it does, no, fair question. I, um, so, of course, we have some focus and the, the focus that we've come to over time, and when I say we, it's marvelous people in the lab and been in the lab before and are working away right now. Um, we all got fascinated by the fact that there is a, a very advanced part of the brain as we think of it, the neocortex on the outside, and it seems capable of underpinning a lot of what we do that, that we're interested in, like language or uh, high-level perception, appreciation of art, or uh, thinking about things, doing mathematics, all of, so on. But then underneath that big outer part, the neocortex, lies a very large part of our forebrain. And, and that large part collectively is called the basal ganglia. And these, um, these, are, these are amazing structures because at once they, they receive a lot of input from this vast thinking machine we've got on the outside. They don't have direct connections to the motor system, so they aren't exactly like motor effectors. It's not that you think with your cortex and then you, you know, send out the result through your basal ganglia. But the basal ganglia seem to be critically involved in, for example, deciding what we will do or what we won't do learning whether we like something, some kind of behavior enough to keep it as one of our behaviors or, or whether we let a given behavior that we emit go and uh, just go on to another kind of behavior. And so over time, many people in the field, not just our lab, but, but certainly our lab's pretty fascinated uh, in this issue, we're, we're thinking that uh, it's going to be impossible to take the approach you mentioned of look at one brain structure and figure out what it does and then QED, right? Because the brain is essentially uh, uh, made up of many, many circuits, so great systems that interconnect with one another and that, that not just kind of like physically interconnect, but that somehow process information together, interact with one another, bounce bounce information off one another, get coordinated with one another. And the uh, coordinating aspect, we've begun to think, is, is very much a part of what these deep brain structures do. They help, they help us develop whole repertoires of behavior, we think, um, that, that let us do a lot of the stuff we've just been talking about of doing things almost automatically, like riding a bike or, you know, take, you know, how do you throw a ball? How do you throw a ball? How does a pitcher throw a ball, a fastball, a curveball? I mean, he practices and practices, but uh, as you guys have just been saying, it, there's no way on earth that he knows which muscles he's, he's moving. And the fine coordination of all that is probably dealt with elsewhere in the brain or a lot of it, but maybe part of the incorporation of his particular way of throwing that pitch or, you know, Nadal's way of hitting a forehand or Federer's backhand, something like that. These patterns and many others that are in our behavior, these patterns probably um, are developed partly through instruction, you know, we, we learn how to do these things, but partly through trial and error learning. and. When it comes to trial and error learning, uh, the, these basal ganglia that I've begun to talk with you about, they are a par excellence trial and error learning devices. So, could so you, I think, could you, oh, so, sorry, no, so I mean, just to finish off your question, yeah, yeah. we think globally, I think we have to think globally about the brain. Um, and, and that's true when we think about disorders as well as when we think about how the brain naturally works, but 
you got to get down and dirty when you study. I mean, I think that's a, a lesson that's been learned in many different uh, aspects of, of many different fields of science. And it's surely, surely true in ours that you simply, we, we're slowly as a field beginning to learn step by step how this mystery of learning and memory, the mystery of seeing, of observing, of hearing, what do you, I mean, how can it be that we, sound molecules are, or molecules are rubbing around in, in the air and we, we hear this as a, you know, a sonata or hmm. symphony, it's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, this is something that, this is one of those things that I was always, uh, when I talk with my uh, students about this, when I teach the sort of introductory neuroscience class, uh, mm -hmm. the last class I tell them about the idea of the binding problem and how we can, how is it that we take everything from our memory and our learning and the experience we're having now and we put it together to become what we're doing right now, just an experience, uh, because there's all these separate modules doing these things. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, these basal ganglia certainly seem to play a role in that. And uh, I'm always telling them, because I get asked this question a lot, like, you know, they say, what do you think? And I go, uh, I don't know, that's for really smart people. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I tell them, go to graduate school and figure it out, and then the Nobel people will call you. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's just an incredible thing. I mean, uh, it, I, I don't want to get too, I, I think I'm, I'm getting a little bit silly here, but I mean, like I said, it, it just gets me to, uh, it actually kind of chokes me up thinking about this and the fact that we have this, inc this incredible machine that, as you said, is basically, uh, you know, it's bazillions of connections uh, all happening at once. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. You had a question, Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was hoping uh, Dr. Grabiel would be able to walk us through um, the, the brain here, I'm, I'm going to put it up on the screen sure. using our brain cam. And, and tell us, so I thought this part, <laughs> the big part was the part that learned, but um, maybe you could break it down. Is a, wait, wait, wait. It is a part that learns. Pro you know, my okay. own guess is that um, some form of, you know, they call it neuroplasticity, that, that this occurs all through the brain. Okay. Now, even the spinal cord has, uh, has to adjust its self, adjust its little synaptic connections, its little communication lines. So, so don't get me wrong, the whole thing learns, but learns what? What kinds of learning? And over what time scales of learning? Is this learning for the whole of, of our lives? But, but you're pointing at, at brain now. You're going to go? Yeah. yeah. Is this, is I'm going to get that on my <laughs> iPhone too. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the um, the uh, the purple part. <laughs> <laughs> the so what is this part. purple part? Uh, so it's a see-through image of brain, and um, oh, it's really beautiful. And so, uh, as as you all know, the basal ganglia are purple, right? <laughs> so yes, deep buried in the brain, you can see that that great big mass, and then the the long tail. So mm -hmm. on the left hand side of the image, as I see it. That's the front of the brain, and uh, bottom is bottom, and the right-hand side is the back end. So the basal ganglia take a quite large central part of, of our brain, and then they have this little tail that, that curves around, and it ends in that little brown button. And that actually is the amygdala, which is related to things like fear conditioning and emotion. Um, okay, I'm going to switch views here. <laughs> Move to the front. Uh, it's really small. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I've got some technical, I'm not as technical, technically agile as Leo here. Um, so this part controls um, the, the process of learning or once the so, process so of learning let me, is let me give you a let me give you an example. Um, right. Let's say um, you uh, you're hungry and you know it's lunchtime and you walk down the street and you know you go to this little place to have lunch and you have the lunch and it's pretty good, so it's kind of reinforcing. And so you know next time maybe you go to some other little place 
for lunch and you know it's okay and you keep doing it and of course people study animals doing that all the time by having them mm -hmm. run in little mazes and things to get as it were lunch or chocolate or something so you do that a few times and pretty soon you get so much reinforcement from going to that first place that you start going to that first place a lot and so you're gradually gradually getting the point where hey man you know somebody says hey, let's go to lunch. And you say, well, let's go to this place. And you start doing that. And eventually it becomes sort of a habit. And then after a while, you hardly even think about it. You know, you've been busy and all of a sudden you got to grab a sandwich. You, you just go there automatically. And that's a, kind of a, a boneheaded little example. But <laughs> it looks like what happens is uh, we use, it's been codified as reinforcement learning, um, we we do something, we're, we're exploring around for what to do, so it's called an exploratory phase, and then uh, we something good happens or something bad happens, we change our behavior a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, until finally we figure, you know, this is pretty good what we're doing now. And we go into the so-called exploitation phase when we begin to do the same thing more and more and more and more. That is the form of learning, a form of learning that's uh, been heavily invested in the basal ganglia and its allied structures, most famously the dopamine containing system, uh, same dopamine that's unfortunately in decline in Parkinson's disease. And that dopamine, uh, a neurotransmitter, apparently acts as a um, reward prediction error so if you expect something expect a reward and it doesn't happen then you may change your behavior and begin to get more reward afterwards more reward afterwards so this is a reinforcement learning system just uh, brilliantly designed and then exploited to to go after things other than uh, the very most elementary rewards we can think about. So that's what I meant when I said maybe you study hard because one day you want to be a doctor. It's just, you know, there are people now, I just had lunch with some wonderful uh, MIT undergrads and gee, one of the uh, young women said, well, I'm going to have to take out loans and so on, so I'm going to go to this particular place for medical school. She's about to graduate and she figures you know, how many hundreds of thousand dollars will she be in debt by the time she gets done with with going to med school? But she has an excellent goal to do it. So this system seems to have uh, been not co-opted, but been incorporated into into even aspirational systems that that involve not just the basal ganglia, but definitely other parts of the brain, most notably the, the neocortex, including our big frontal lobes that we humans are so proud of having. The, um, of course, the, the part that you're talking about running on dopamine, we're talking about accumbens and ventral tegmental area, medial forebrain bundle. So th that's the reward system. And that, it's yeah, for, nigra. Yeah. So, I mean, and for those of you that aren't big on this stuff, that's the same part of your brain that's activated when you take heroin or you eat a good meal or... You watch The Family Guy, if you like it. Um, the, th the thing is, I mean, I always thought of this, uh, this part of the brain uh, as being something that's important, as you said, in really pretty basic reinforcement uh, type learning. Uh, so whereas the stuff you're talking about, say, with, with the, the medical or the potential medical student, um, that's really, that's a lot of delay of reward. Um, so... Are you saying then that this system has actually actually been co-opted by something sort of we'll call it a higher order process, a uh, cortical process, or? Right, so it's, it, that's what I meant by it's sort of been incorporated into the right. greater brain, and so and that's why when originally you asked me, do we study one little part of the brain? Of course we do because we got to actually do experiments, so we <laughs> study certain circuits that interrelate this deep core to the outer rind, the neocortex mainly. Mm -hmm. But um, 
we're always. I, I, I'll give you. I, I'll give you a concrete example. So, the basal ganglia are thought to be the part of the brain that, once upon a time in the evolution that we don't really know about, unfortunately, um, controlled uh, the simple behaviors that we that we all of us animals do, like locomotion, chewing, uh, swallowing, uh, mm. eating, and, and all of that. So all of these, as you said very early on in this show, everything has to be coordinated in time, which is a big mystery. And the basal ganglia maybe were terrific coordinators of these so-called central pattern generators. Central pattern generators in the sense of little uh, subparts of our brain that take care of, for example, of quadrupedal locomotion or swimming in the case of an eel or something. Mm -hmm. So so one idea that, that we came up with a while ago is that, okay, so the basal ganglia certainly seem to do that. I think there's a, a, a ton of evidence that makes that plausible. But maybe when the basal ganglia have such strong connectivity to the upstairs part of the brain, to the neocortex, maybe they become cognitive pattern generators. They essentially let us develop new patterns, new uh, ways of behavior, new uh, ways of thought, new ways of, of putting together sequences of behavior. And then these sequences may become chunked together and actually may become you know, just as reliable bits of our kind of brain wherewithal that we can call upon almost as reliable as the good old inbuilt innate central pattern generators or cpgs with which we're born so that's really cool if we have yeah, a system that, ever. <laughs> you know, yeah, that, that helps us make new patterns of behavior so that's uh, we're we're big on that idea and you know which is just an idea but it has a number of implications scientifically and and also medically to think of what could be wrong if uh, a little boy starts growing up and then all of a sudden he starts making a lot of repetitive movements you know he rolls the rug up and rolls the rug back rolls the yeah. rug up <clears throat> rolls the rug back that's a story that i heard about just two days uh ago i father of a autistic child and as I think many people by now are, are aware in obsessive compulsive disorder and Tourette mm -hmm. syndrome and that whole spectrum of disorders and in autism even in unmedicated schizophrenics yeah. these repetitive behaviors are so terribly prominent they can become just a curse and just a dominant aspect of behavior so could it be that we have these circuits that either go into overdrive or they're in overdrive, but normally they're happily kept in check by some partner of theirs so that they can be in balance, you know, with doing it or not doing it, and they've lost that partnership. So we are deeply, deeply interested in trying to understand that, that this whole uh, idea that we could make uh, in addition to all the innate behaviors that we have, we can make up new behaviors. And when I say behavior, I certainly include thought. We make up new right. thoughts. We don't have any problem with knowing about that. We just don't usually think about our sequences of behavior, like going for the lunch, as being something like, you know, um, writing a new piece of music. Right. But at some crude level, it's, it's perhaps a little bit similar. And so these mechanisms are... Uh, are very vulnerable in some disorders and and if we learn enough i mean i'm tell you what i mean uh, i'm a great i'm it, we we started this show with the awesomeness of the brain yeah. and of nature in general and that is the driving force that got me into this field but i must say um the farther we go into the field uh the more i i am deeply, deeply interested in the idea that even us, those of us who want to do pure science, 
we might really be able to help other people. And that's a great goal. And I, I think I'm going to put in a little plug uh, just to say that uh, people who aren't in science or are just starting out in science, they may kind of wonder, is it okay to be a, just a pure scientist, like a, maybe a mathematician even, you know, even more in the purity scale? But, it, it, and of course it is. It's just that I think there's a little bit of a trend in the States right now and in some other countries in, in Europe to um, oppose pure science and, and uh, science that has some translational value. And I, 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 I'm of the opinion, and sorry to make the plug, that, that these are so deeply enmeshed that uh, we can have lots of people who never, ever, ever want to do anything translational, but it's awfully nice to have others who, who would like to do that. And in, it just so happens that in the field that I have um, found myself working in, those two are so interconnected, it's hard to talk about the basal ganglia without, for example, mentioning Parkinson's disease, which sure. already has been mentioned in the show, Huntington's, OCD, dystonia, and so on. So that's a very natural alliance, and and I think uh, a helpful one. I, I, mean, I, I must say I that totally agree um, with that. I, uh, I, and I mean, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead, Mark. Oh, uh, okay. So uh, I, was, I was just going to say that you know, in, in science, you know, if if you're a young uh, scientist starting off your graduate studies, you know, you can take a look at um, you know different types of experiments and if you prefer engineering well you can still go into neuroscience uh, with uh, you know a strong taste for uh, engineering aspects and sort of um, you know apply what others who are doing the, the most purest form of science just basically asking questions and testing hypotheses that lead to an understanding of a major comp complex system but then come in and, and really participate in that transfer element and maybe even team up with somebody who's doing the uh, uh, the really early um, discovery science, you can still have a lot of fun. And that's something I've chosen to do with my career is sort of take it uh, a partnership <clears throat> with somebody who's doing um, you know uh, R01 style, which is a, a grant um, a mechanism where they you ask fundamental questions about uh, certain processes. That, well, I translate myself, and that's why I because I, I love engineering, but I was trained as a biologist, so it's kind of. So I, I really see your point about, you know, encouraging and, uh, you know, people to ask those fundamental questions because it does translate. It indeed translates. And, um, you know, how can you not, by understanding the inner workings of the brain, tackle one of the many disorders? Um, and and it's, even if you're not doing clinical work, uh, you're certainly moving it forward. And uh, probably you have a lot of trainees that have gone through your lab that have gone on to... Um, do that exact uh, thing to go on towards the interface between clinic and uh, lab. Yeah, um, we we uh, almost always have in the lab at various levels of age, um, people, engineers, some physicists, uh, some biologists, and some pre-meds, and and uh, and we keep up with one another. And it's it's uh, af after you know when they they move on, and it's. It's a really wonderful thing that uh, what you're talking about, that so many people find their way um, to do a bit of both or at least to collaborate with other people. And, and I, I think it's, frankly, I think by now it's just the only way to do it because finally, finally, after all these years, we're beginning to get powerful methods. But these powerful methods are so powerful that it really takes um, sub discipline experts to put it all together. I mean, I never thought, I mean, we now work on, we're interested in time. We do a lot of work in, uh, with uh, spectral analyses of neural data. And, you know, I, this is, has been all new for me, totally new for me, not, not at all what I uh, did before, but it's just uh, fantastic how that kind of extension of disciplines is occurring in neuroscience. I, it, it's, it's a really, it is a, I, I don't know whether it's going to turn out to be a unique time, but I think this is a very, very special time in neuroscience. I think it's 
absolutely fabulous time to to go into the field except for the difficulty of funding because we can begin to not only just observe brain but actually uh, carry out experiments by manipulating aspects of brain in in real time in in clever experiments and try to identify it sounds so, you know, it kind of sounds so trite to say, well, identify the mechanisms that underlie X. <laughs> you know, you get pretty bored with hearing that. I myself get bored with hearing that. But I passionately <laughs> want to do it because I know that when, sometimes, not always, but sometimes when such mechanisms are are discovered, I mean, just, it's a, a state change, just a state change well, in the field. And we're right yeah. on the edge of that. We, genetic models yeah. are now within the grasp whereby you can actually study advanced cognition, right? Where you can do genetic manipulations and then study learning where 20 years ago, you know, the fruit fly learning process was somewhat limited. Now you can, you know, manipulate a higher mammal, one with, uh, with quite That's a right. learning capacity. And so it, this is a very, very exciting time because now you're digging into the molecular anatomy of the human, or not the human, but the, maybe the animal brain and by translation, the human brain and, and seeing things that have never been seen before. Um, wh one thing I'd like to do is uh, um, get a, a, a take of some of the uh, work that's going on in your lab, some of the experiments that you guys are doing um, at the molecular level, physiology, and then perhaps David uh, could ask you about um, some of the... Uh, Cognitive studies, you know how you how you study models. But before we do, um, I'm gonna have to take a minute to thank Netflix for uh, sponsoring Futures in Biotech. Um, this will just take a minute. <laughs> Netflix <laughs> delivers movies directly to your home and saves you time, money, and hassle. You can watch instantly thousands of TV episodes and movies. They are streamed directly to your, to your PC or Mac, or can be streamed directly to your TV uh, via Netflix-ready device, including the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 or Nintendo Wii at our house. We use the Roku box, the Wii, the iPad, we use laptops, we use iPhones, <laughs> we use iPods, and we're a family of four. So you can get Netflix any way you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> plus, we, we get the DVD. If you, you, you request a DVD, they send it to you uh, by mail in one business day. And um, you can watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want. There are no late fees or due dates. Um, our pick of the week um, is uh, I, I picked the universe. So I went on to Netflix and have in my instant queue is a documentary um, series called The Universe, and it's by uh, 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 Tony Long. There's about 64 episodes over five seasons, and they cover everything. I'm going to pull up uh, an image here. Um, just here's an example. I'm on Netflix. This uh, did I switch? No. Okay, here we are. There we are. Oh, wow, there's a lag. Okay, so um, so here's an image of uh, uh, the website, but you can go with your TV and just tune in if you have a, a, a Blu-ray device that's enabled for Netflix or that the Wii or, or whatnot. Um, there's, uh, you get to pick from five seasons on demand, no commercials. Uh, here's uh, season two, Alien Planets, The Milky Way, Alien Moons, Dark Matter, Astrobiology, Space Travel, Supernovas, Constellations, Unexplained Mysteries. Uh, nebulas, gravity, cosmic apocalypse. Ooh, <laughs> that one looks pretty good. Uh, maybe. Um, so th th that's my pick because it, it, it's just this um, fantastic series, and I watch it with my kids. And it's something we we Netflix is one of those things that brings the family together, and without commercials, we can sit and enjoy really uh, solid on-demand content. Um, so you can instantly watch the universe or choose from thousands of TV episodes or other movies. When you register for a free trial membership, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Uh, be sure to sign up for your, tri uh, for your free trial at netflix.com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of twit and futures in biotech. All right. Uh, <laughs> we did it. Yay. Good um, job, Mark. Thank you. Hey, so <laughs> I, I, I try. <laughs> I try. Um, so how do you... 
uh, of the basal ganglia um, with genetics. Perhaps you could give an example of a, a genetic model. And I, I guess you can't really pull away some of the uh, cognitive stuff from that same study, can you? Or do you? Yeah, fine. Or do you do I, all I'm three together? To. So uh, let me take a couple examples, actually, that we're working on right now. Um, we cloned some genes a few years ago that that are uh, very strongly concentrated in the basal ganglia in the striatum, that main central ball. Most of that um, purple thing was striatum. Um, and these are very interesting genes because they sent second messengers and then they, of all things, they actually have a kind of output side that, that, um, that targets major genes known in cancer, the RAS, uh, RAS and RAP genes. And, and they, these genes turn out to be related to neuroplasticity in some systems they are in the brain. And so we found those, and um, Jill Crittenden here in the lab and uh, has made knockouts and of various sorts of those genes, and and it's it's quite remarkable. We're finding that the animals with alterations in these genes that were made by her brilliant engineering, that those alterations change repetitive behaviors in these animals when the animals are given. Um, a drug like amphetamine or one of these so-called psychoactive or psychomotor stimulant drugs, these animals uh, may react too much or too little. So that's actually pretty exciting because, you know, <laughs> uh, reactions to drugs and, and as I said before, these repetitive behaviors are very important in our lives and in the lives of people who uh, either become addicted to drugs or have a one of the classic disorders. So then you can say, well, okay, so you've got a mouse that, you know, he moves around, he, you know, does something too much. So what? Oh, look, beautiful. <laughs> I didn't okay, know you had switch all these. Over to the image. I, I'm, I'm pulling up so, the typical singling pathway here, and yeah, you cloned. That's gorgeous. It's kind of hard to see. So, so I'm sorry, I, I cannot myself point, but good for okay. you. So. What you're seeing here is the line on the top is the outer membrane of the of the cell in a little diagram, and the kind of bluey thing with two arms on the left is a neurotransmitter receptor, um, and yep. then all the little balls are and arrows are just indicating that the most extraordinary. Um, that's what I meant by everything in biology is control mechanisms. Extraordinary uh, coming together and pulling apart of molecules. You're seeing them in different colors here, which bit by bit, if, if all the little guys get together in just the right way and become so-called activated, for example, by phosphorylation, then eventually they may even get to go down to the lowest part of your diagram through those little gaps to influence genes themselves. And we did uh, work a number of years ago on this sort of gene activation and found that, uh, for example, even one shot of amphetamine or cocaine, something like that, just one will turn on genes in the basal ganglia in very particular uh, patterns, patterns that, that are related to the connections and the neurotransmitters in there. And so in the mice that Jill Crittenden has has generated, de novo, the mutations in them by their absence, that these mice respond differently depending on those pathways that you talked about. Well, so as I was starting to say, okay, so so what? Well, then it turns out that let me ask. Those, let me ask. Let me. Sorry, if yeah. I interject. We we got about a one second, maybe even two second lag here. Um, so what I showed is a diagram of a singling pathway where you're looking at the extracellular space. Um, you've got so cocaine or uh, amphetamine or or a molecule reaches the cell surface, triggers a cascade where uh, uh, maybe about 25 molecular machines in a sort of a sequential activation. And that and you maybe mentioned even more. 
yeah, maybe even more, results in a single amp, a signal amplification which tells the nucleus to turn on genes on or off. So there's an extracellular communication compound and, and through that cascade can amplify in a very dynamic way uh, and information and take it to the nucleus for gene expression. And I, I was just pointing out this so that the listeners that are, um, uh, well, the people that are listening and not seeing, uh, um, we're showing this diagram of about, well, here oh. there's about, oh, I don't know, 20 molecular machines, all proteins that through uh, that are single amplification tools that the cell uses. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll switch it back to you. <laughs> No, no, that's fine. It's um, good to know so that some people will yeah. be hearing and not and not seeing at the same time. But but the story goes on by, well, it turns out that when this these mice are generated, it turns out they have disorders in the way neurotransmitters interact with one another in the striatum. So the dopamine system, the cholinergic system, the glutamate system, all of those are different names of neurotransmitters. So there is a level of interaction uh, at, uh, of different molecular pathways inside nerve cells that is absolutely fabulous. And all of these changes can go on lickety split, very, very, you know, in millisecond time frames uh, and, and get their effects, as you just said, uh, by virtue of being felt at the level of the cell's nucleus, those effects can be very long lasting. In fact, they can last for the, as long as the animal is alive. So, so there's one, uh, one very concrete example of starting out with an, uh, a, a single gene and then going all the way to making a mouse. So it's sort of, exploration, you find that the gene is a basal ganglia gene, it's a striatum-based gene, it, it's in the cells that interact with the dopamine system and cholinergic system, and then you make your mouse, you find there's something wrong with the mouse, you try to find the mechanism, and of course we'd love to cure the mouse through a kind of mouse therapy. And so if that <laughs> mouse therapy worked, then gee, you know, maybe that would in some way be applicable, you know, however distantly to some of the problems that that occur in people. And I can certainly say that Jill Crittenden and I have been very, very excited by the, and, and moved really by the fact that um, this particular gene is sometimes there's a mutation of it in dogs. We don't yet know about humans. We're trying to find out, but, but people have volunteered that they, you know, dogs with um, unusual behaviors and so we're we know that several different species um, can have this particular behavioral effect related to that particular cascade that our that our so-called novel once novel gene is is acting on so it's that's what there there is a, a an example where if if you're lucky and uh, the molecule can go all the way. I have a friend and colleague here who has a, a gene that probably is related to something very much like obsessive compulsive disorder, something very much like uh, autism in a mouse with social deficits. So these these examples are are hopeful examples for the field. We we interviewed Mario Capecchi. And he was oh, describing yeah, no, um, a gene knockout that led to a dis and what a fantastic approach to uh, discovering how behavior can be affected by the a single machine inside the cell. They did the knockout and uh, this this one knockout and it removed it the uh, microglia. It, so the microglia were mistargeted, I think that was the case. And um, not having microglia, which is a type of, I suppose, white blood cell specialized for the brain, um, which is probably used, in, in fact, to clear disease uh, <laughs> or potential disease, those animals compensate from their lack of ability to uh, handle uh, disease processes in the brain by over... Uh, <laughs> um, a cleaning, right? Or, or what do you call it uh, uh, for animals? They sort of grooming, 
which is which is amazing, right? What a great yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic story. And, and so you, you have go ahead, um, go ahead. Go oh, ahead, Dave. Uh, no, you you had a point to finish, Mark. Go ahead. Well, it, so um, the the genes that you have also uh, point to some of these behaviors. Uh, so so yeah, and that's a you're making a very important or bringing up a very very important point, and that is. Um, Sometimes we think about, oh, if there's a disorder or something, it has to be related to a gene or two genes or three genes or something. But you know, these genes, they're acting on circuits in the brain. They're acting on, on communication systems in the brain. So it could be that a hundred different genes are going to be found related to some of the disorders that we're talking about or 500 genes or who knows how many um, and, and how could so many genes if they're and they can be very different from one another how could they do that and so the, the field is beginning to think that look the answer is that that we have in our our uh, cells our nerve cells um, these cascades of biochemistry in effect going on that you showed a one example of and these cascades can be affected in neurons that lie in different brain circuits. So there are circuits related to seeing, to hearing, uh, to loving one another, and so on. I mean, the whole gamut of behavior is underlaid by these great uh, arching circuits. And so it's very, very exciting that several different labs are coming up with different kinds of clues. And, and that may relate, you know, ultimately, obviously it relates ultimately to mechanism and hopefully, ultimately, this is going to relate to some of the heterogeneity in, in, um, in disease states and in their, their uh, genetic, I hate to say cause, but their genetic origin or the, mm. the genetic disabilities that in their cells that provoke those those behaviors it's it's a it's an amazing i mean you're 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 hitting on something very important that's going on right now and um in molecular biology and that's you know we used to think there must be a gene for schizophrenia and, or you know a gene for this or that and and now we we know that there can be single mutations that just pop up they just you know there never has been one before and uh, they have there are, these are all named now. I won't go into all the jargon, but it, so many different ways to get to something that is, for example, Parkinson's-like. Right. Wow. Um, so maybe it's when, stunning. Oh, it's ahead. really stunning. Your turn, Dave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your turn. Um, no, that is stunning. And I mean, what it, it puts me in mind of is is the whole notion of um, well, there's two things. First off, that we could learn a lot about order by looking at disorder. Uh, but also, I mean, when you're looking at, as you say, Parkinson's like, or even, uh, autism like, and that is close to home for me because you probably can't hear it, but there's a little autistic boy in the next room playing video games. It's my son. Um, he's by the way, you know, don't ever play him. He'll own you. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, the thing is that, I mean, when we want to look at something like this, so, some of these sort of disordered behaviors or even just regular, uh, sort of standard human cognition. Uh, what kind of behavioral techniques uh, have you, are you fond of using? I noticed that you have, uh, you've used, say, T mazes, things like that for some of the timing stuff. Um, but for, say for something like, you said like an autistic mouse, let's, as you had the example, what kind of uh, behavioral uh, preparation are you using there? Yeah, so, so here's the sort of thing that's possible now. We can, um, we can take a mouse and, and essentially put him in a playground of a great big playground that has little little places in it where he can run around in one or he can poke his little nose at, at little ports and get reward in another or he can um, groom in another. You brought up grooming so that these animals are constantly uh, kind of going through rituals of grooming. And, and so we can observe them. All right, that's fine. And so there right. is a, as, as I, I know you know, uh, 
there are many different little kind of behavioral tests we can put them through, which, which to them, I think, sometimes they really are a form of play. Yeah. But, but then we can say, well, what happens nowadays there uh, is a reasonably new technique called optogenetics, um, fabulous new method, actually, which lets us take that mouse and let's say uh, before we put him in the playground, we uh, engineer that mouse to have a particular um, molecule in a place in his brain, and those molecules can be activated by light. This is the brilliant new discovery of optogenetics. So now when he's in the playground, we can just put a little optical fiber into the place where the gene has been put in and turn the light on, it's a laser light. And when we shine the light, we can turn off the cells or we can turn on the cells and, and therefore we can find out if these cells are required for playing in the sandbox or poking your nose to get a little bit of reward or something like that. So these are, as uh, you know very well, David, sure. uh, psychologists used to uh, make lesions laboriously with various devices yeah. and so on, but we, we can we can begin to look at behaviors kind of online and, and and the effect of different brain bits online. And I I think that's awfully important and, and we, so that's a form of manipulation and, right. and we do that in spades now in the lab and many, many labs are doing it. Um, but but we also now, thanks to the efforts of many people, can put in many, very fine microelectrodes, and so, and we do that a great deal in our brain, and record the neural activity that occurs in the brain when these animals are doing one of these little tasks. And I've been absolutely amazed at what one can learn just by having a rat in a simple little old-fashioned tea maze, like... Right. You know, everybody learned about in psychology, the little animal <laughs> starts out, just runs down the maze, maybe he gets a cue about going right or left, and if he goes right or left, according to the cue, he gets a, a terrific reward, like we give him chocolate. So, that they, <laughs> do they rats start like chocolate, to, really? They love chocolate, and so oh, do mice. Mark, rats, fact, rats will work for chocolate. I mean, well, I've used uh, Cocoa Puffs, actually. Because rats love chocolate, rats love sugar, and there's no better place uh, to find it than a child's ch breakfast. Breaking, you're breaking I, I, up, Dave. Um, I, I must tell you guys one story. I, I uh, there was a very wonderful time in the lab a few years ago. I'm sorry, when, you're breaking up, Dave. Can you please repeat that? No, it's it's. I was just making a joke. Forget about it. It's a good joke. Oh, it's about <laughs> rats liking chocolate. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Maybe the uh, maybe Burke caught it uh, on tape, and maybe it's my internet. Um, so yeah, I don't. I don't want. I want to uh, focus on, on, on uh, you know, the, the, the interesting aspect. Of, well, uh, no, not the interesting, the, the element that, that uh, uh, rats will work for chocolate here. But, because what I find absolutely incredible is that you can have a dip switch or a dip switch to turn genes on, turn genes off, and mm -hmm. um, look at the effect of those genes on the, uh, the behavioral patterns of those animals, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Do you do, you do so you also have electrodes as well that can detect mm -hmm. uh, readings? Uh, they could measure electrophysiological responses at the same right. time, and 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 that's been uh, we sure do, and that's been uh, a real revelation to us. I mean, this is again a, we're we we're, we're one lab. There are many labs that are doing this, but we hit on the idea of let's take an animal like a, a rat or a mouse, um, and let's start them out on a simple little task we started with teammates tasks we've done a lot of different ones now um let's start out and let's record and find out what's in the brain right from the get-go right before they don't they haven't even learned it yet so they're naive they're they're uh, untutored and we put them into this situation we take them to school every day and as it were put them in the apparatus we uh, record from the brain cells and as many as we can, and then we find out what happens in there as the animal learns. And that that's really, uh, it's a mind-blowing experience because <laughs> there's just wholesale plasticity in the brain when we learn. 
And when these little animals pick up a habit, we study, a, a, we really study habit learning pretty, pretty much. Um, when they learn habits, a whole new patterns of nerve cell activity develop in the striatum. They're really new. They, they weren't there at the beginning. And so we can see them develop. And then, you know, there comes a time when the percent correct scores tell us that, well, these animals kind of like they've, they've learned it. Well, then what, one of the tricks we've played is we just keep having them do it, even though they know, right, they, we, that's in psychology called overtraining or in, you know, when you go to college, it's called grinding it in, get it really well learned. Mm -hmm. And so, so the brain keeps on changing during this so-called overtraining period. And that's, that's become a point of fascination for us. So then we can say, well, you know, it, what happens if we now, we take away the rewards, no more chocolate, and we so-called extinguish that behavior? Do those patterns stay? Are they gone? Um, and one of the things we found a little while ago work that was a good part of Tara Barnes' thesis um, a little bit ago was that during that extinction phase, the learned patterns of activity go away, okay? So, all mm -hmm. right, they're gone. Yep. We told ourselves, but then we tried putting back the chocolate so kind of reacquisition phase, the animals run down the maze, they go, oh, geez, here's chocolate. I'm going to do this thing again. And bang, oh, the very first day they do that, the whole pattern is back, the whole learned pattern. And these are complicated patterns. I'm not talking about like the activity of one neuron. These are ensembles of neurons that collectively have changed what they're interested in, in, in firing in relation to, how they, how they get turned on and turned off during the course of a behavior. And, and what, what seems to happen is that this striatal region I've been talking about, it's a, little, it's a learning machine, I think. It's gradually picking up a, like a habitual way of responding itself. And the, the, the particular pattern is, is frightfully interesting because there's a lot of, after they've learned, there's a lot of activity at the beginning of these runs and at the end. But there's not much in the middle. And we were, we were really stunned. I mean, how could this be? It's a sensory motor part of the brain. It's got to have cells that are active when the guy's running down the mazes. But we think that as, as we learn habits, our brain brackets, kind of chunks those behaviors so that they're easily accessible to us. So then all we need to do if we're going to kind of emit something that's a habitual behavior, like I could maybe do this habitually, just kind of without thinking every once in a while I do this. My brain's got that all packaged up in a little chunk. And, and you know, somebody up there in the brain, probably in the cortex, presses go, and out comes that whole behavior. That's a really neat device to have. So that's what I meant. I mean, there... I lost, we lost you. Yeah, that's... Uh, maybe you can hear us. Um, I still got her. Burke, are you there? Mark, it's fine. Did you hear any of that? It's fine, Mark. I did. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I I I see what you're saying. Is it? I mean, is it I th um, we're having some. No, you're having them, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, brain freeze. I oh, I don't know. Is Burke getting this? Sorry, uh, Burke. Yeah, can you hear me? Everything's fine, Mark. Okay. Mark, the problem is on your end. Wow, that's nuts. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Good. Well, that's good because then the, the, the quality would be great on their side. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Anyway, Go ahead, David. Um, what, we were, what, what we were talking about there is the idea that uh, we've got, it's such a, basically, I guess, and maybe we ought to wrap it up on this because uh, Mark's, we're losing, we're losing poor Mark. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think perhaps we lost hours ago, but that's a whole nother matter. Um, the, yeah, that's a joke, by the way. Um, it seems to me that this whole thing, you know, it's interesting. I think that people, and the chat room's been going on about this quite a bit, the IRC, talking about, um, you know, in some respects, 
it almost seems at times where, and I think we started out this way, where neuroscience, uh, I don't think people realize that while we can be looking at this, these really hardcore things about genes and about neurotransmitters and modulators and, and receptors, we can all also be making uh, answering questions about very big issues, big behavioral things, mm -hmm. uh, big cognitive things. And I think that, uh, you know, it, at times it almost seems to get perilously close to philosophy. Uh, but I think that uh, getting that kind of message out there uh, is, is, is an important thing for, uh, uh, for, for people to understand, for, for not just for people in the field, uh, but also uh, for the general public to understand what uh, their research dollars, uh, you know, where they're going. And uh, pure research and applied research are both very important things. Well, this is an amazing time, right? Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, especially with our ability to go in at the molecular level and uh, turn some of those machines off. And if there's 30, 40 in a single amplification process, and while mutagenesis or mutations that occur naturally, spontaneously as we... Uh, as uh, you know, you're born with what you have. Um, it could be a break in any of those uh, pathways, and uh, uh, Dr. Grabiel's work really elucidating those pathways allows us to then, you know, understand the mechanism of our diseases that we have, and then how to go in and tackle them. And so, I, I'll encourage NIH to <laughs> <laughs> keep at it, and 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 we're gonna definitely follow this story. Um, because it, it's it's your your approach is you know I love the way you you take it from thirty seven thousand feet with a sort of understanding of how the brain works and it, it's very reminiscent of the Kendall way. He's a uh, 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 what, how would you he's he he his first training wasn't in medicine but it was in um, psychiatry not psychiatry it was um, how do you but I'm having a complete brain freeze but um, people can go back and listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Kendall interview, um, but then then taking it into the molecular level, and so taking the the brain by uh, from its highest level of function, and then looking down mechanistically into the all the way down to the protein molecular level uh, is a fascinating uh, way. I tend to take things from the uh, molecular level and hope that we can uh, translate that to clinic by taking one target at a time, but, um, it's a, it's, I can only handle a few proteins <laughs> and I really appreciate, uh, people that can handle, you know, higher brain function. And, uh, so it's really, really exciting. So it was a, a, a tremendous pleasure to speak with you, uh, yeah. Dr. Grebel. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. much. And I, I hope we've, uh, hope, you know, some, some of the listeners have been inspired to tackle, uh, some of the um, um, approaches uh, that you that that you're using, and some of the grand picture uh, of the of, of you know cognitive sciences, um, uh, rather than take my necessarily my approach, because I, I really think that uh, we're at that stage where we can. Um, so uh, thank thank you very much for coming on. Uh, our our guest today was a professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT, uh, Dr. Ann Grabiel. Thank you very much for uh, being on the show. Thank you. Um, uh, also, we had our co-host, uh, Dr. Dave Broadbeck, who's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Psychology at Algoma University in St. Marie, uh, Ontario. Thank you uh, for co-hosting. And I think, I, I really think this is going to be a part one of part of two parts, uh, possibly... Uh, at um, Dr. Grabiel's um, convenience, and if we could be so lucky to have her back on, we could expand on um, uh, on the discussion. This was really, really uh, great. I had a little bit of technical difficulty on my side, and uh, so I, I apologize if this was a little uh, um, sort of s scattered at the end. But <laughs> I think there's going to be an excellent second show in line here, and I'll make sure Perfect. that I have my interview running. Thank thanks again to both of you. No problem, Mark. Thank you.